Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. I'm J.R. Lowry. This is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, which is brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you live the career you deserve, providing career coaching, content, courses, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise.io online and join today. Today, my guest is Deborah Smith, who is the co-founder and CEO of the CenterCap Group, a certified women-owned business and boutique investment bank based in Stamford, Connecticut, that is focused on all things real estate. CenterCap provides strategic advisory, capital raising, and consulting related services to private and public sector companies and fund managers in the real estate industry. Deborah has worked in financial services with a focus on M&A and real estate investing for more than two decades. With past roles at Morgan Stanley, Wachovia, Lehman, and CBRE, she branched out on her own about 13 years ago. Apart from her work at CenterCap, Deborah is a board member at AIMCO, the apartment investment and management company, which is a publicly listed REIT real estate investment trust on the New York Stock Exchange. And she's also involved in a variety of trade groups focused on real estate investing. She earned her bachelor's degrees both in economics and in law, and both with honors from the University of Sydney. Deb, welcome. Thanks for being here today. All right. Thanks for having me, Jaya. Yeah, so I'd uh, love to hear a little bit about um, what you're doing today, but let's let's start at the beginning. So you grew up on a dairy farm in Australia. Yes, I, I definitely did. I was in a dairy farm for quite a, a great proportion of my childhood. And in rural Australia, uh, we, we moved around a little bit, but that's definitely my background. So I got an early course in working hard, long hours for poor compensation at, from a very young age. And, and you, you mentioned uh, before we started that you, your parents, neither of them even finished high school and you were the first person to go to college in your family or university? Yeah, that's right. Neither of my parents went to high school and uh, both, neither of my brothers went to college and it was, I have a lot of first cousins. We're a big dairy farming family. And so I, I guess I broke out of the mold a little bit in deciding to pursue and, and, and go on to university after I finished high school. How do you define a big dairy farming family. How many, how many cows did you have on your dairy farm growing up? Oh, you know, it ranged up to a few hundred. So anywhere between a hundred, few hundred, we, we went to a few different dairy farms, but it's um, the, the way it's done, it, you know, you can process through huge amounts of cattle with the, with the size of farms these days. It's certainly different from when I was a little kid and the modernization, some of the technology that's come into the dairy farming industry is pretty amazing. Yeah. What, what did you envision, you know, growing up in that environment, what did you envision yourself doing professionally before you went off to university? That's a good question. I didn't envision doing anything <laughs> except being a dairy farmer. Yeah. It wasn't until I was around the 11th grade and I, uh, I had a really great economics teacher um, who somehow saw something in me that I, I didn't think too much about at the time, but it turns out I could be a pretty good student and uh, put the word and the idea into my head, I should go to university. Mm. And so that didn't happen until I was in the 11th grade wow. and thinking that it was going to be a, a change. And, and I said, okay, well, all right. So I put in for university and I did well in high school and I got into the University of Sydney in a pretty hard degree and then went on and did a, a double degree and first in economics and then as a law degree. So it, it was definitely not something I'd contemplated. <laughs> you were contemplating being a tax attorney around the time of your graduation. And yet you ended up in investment banking at, <laughs> at Morgan Stanley. So yeah. how did that all play out? Yeah. Again, not too much thought process there either. I, you know, I'd been to law school and, and I, uh, when I was going into probably my last year or looking to graduate, I had actually applied to 
to, to be a tax attorney at the big accounting firms. Mm. And I had put into Morgan Stanley um, with no grand plan. I didn't really know what banking was. But, you know, you learn from your friends and what they're doing and what they're aiming for. And I didn't have a whole lot of guidance from my from home. And so, but I did have some good professors, again, throughout my college degree. I was very, very lucky who gave me a lot of good advice along the way. And so I put in for Morgan Stanley and I was lucky, uh, very fortunate that somebody there, uh, you know, saw something that it was worth taking a risk on me. And I, I started and, and I, I don't mind telling you that I had a bet with my, one of my good friends from, from college that who would last beyond three weeks uh, she had started as a consultant and I'd started as a banker and I was convinced I wasn't going to last when <laughs> I knew I didn't know anything about finance, uh, that I was not, I was way out of my league. But hey, look, I'm here 25 years later, so I guess I can laugh about it. <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah. Did you, when you started working for them, were you in Australia or were you in the US? I was in Australia. So I had started out uh, in Melbourne and the Morgan St- where Morgan Stanley's office was at the time. And I actually spent my first, most of my first year working on the privatization of the power grid in South Australia. Okay. So I'd started on the job. They packed me off to, to work in South Australia. And, and I got a call and said, you have to go to the US. And uh, I showed up in our New York office. And, uh, and the rest is history. I was the loner here for a year. And I ended up staying. And I got internally promoted at Morgan Stanley. And, uh, and, the, and then I went on. And here I am. Still in banking. Still, still in, in banking. banking. And still in yeah. the New York area. Yeah. So how did you find the work during your early professional days? What did you what did you find that you liked and didn't like? Because I, I would imagine you didn't really have a tremendous sense going into it, what it was really going to be like day to day. You know, I, I look back and I really am surprised that I made it through my first year. Yeah. It's um I didn't know anything. Uh uh, about finance, and um, I was clearly very unsophisticated and behind my peers from what I had considered. You know, I there was a lot of accountants and finance people, and and I, I didn't have that expertise. And if I knew back then what I know now, I, I really would have been even more concerned. <laughs> but yeah. at the time, I just kind of rolled with the punches. But you know, when you come from a place of zero expectation, which I, there was no expectations on me coming from home. Um, so whatever I achieved was going to be better than, you know, staying on a farm or working in a supermarket. So it's, yeah. you know, it's just whatever the expectation is. And so I, I kind of set my own expectations. And uh, Morgan Stanley was a great firm. They were very, very, very good to me and invested in me and trained me and, and were patient. But, but again, I, I had an associate in my first year in Australia, who was exceptional. He taught me so much and he was so patient with all my mistakes and all the errors I made. And uh, he was very, very patient with me. And it, it set me up uh, for a very strong career in banking and someone I still keep in contact through to this day. So, so again, another person along the way where I, I'm not sure I, I quite paid it the value at the time, but, yeah. but now I look back and as I've gotten older, I've become a big push on mentors because mentors are really, really important. Um, and they can really guide you and help you develop through your career and see things that you mightn't consider important at the time, but but they are because the things you focus on at the same time when you're young are not important, <laughs> but you think they are. And so your balance is a little off. So yeah. very, very grateful for, for the folks who helped guide me along. Yeah. I mean, getting that early career mentorship can make a huge difference. Yeah. It is. It's the it's the teaching and and it is a combination of needing to figure things out on your own. And mm. you know, I tell junior folks today who are looking to come into this industry that one of the big uh, differentiating points on being successful as a junior banker is knowing when to ask for help, but mm. also knowing when you shouldn't, um, and being able to get that balance of figuring out yourself. Um, but knowing there's only so much time you should figure out before you should ask for help because some people can be unforgiving when things take a long time. And it's like, well, how do you get that balance of being told, well, why didn't you spend the time to figure this out or why are you asking me versus why didn't you ask me? If you needed some help, why didn't you ask? And right. getting that balance right, it can really make a big difference, um, I think, in being a successful junior, you know, junior analyst. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in the scheme of things, I always tell people, you know, err on the side of asking for help because, you know, I'd much rather have you seek clarity than, you know, spin your wheels. 
Yeah. There's, you know, there's obviously a certain amount you got to let people learn for themselves and you have to push them out of their comfort zones a little bit by not being there to prop them up and maybe as much as they would, they would like sometimes. Yeah. And that's right. And that's where you get your balance and trying to figure out how to, to get that right. I'm not sure the balance changes that much. Um, as we get older, we, we just get better at it. <laughs> we, we, we just get better at the balancing. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, then you went to Wachovia, you went to Lehman, then you went out and tried the buy side, moved to CBRE, uh, to run their global M and a business. So how did those subsequent roles before you branched out on your own, how did those subsequent roles really round out your understanding of what you wanted to do professionally, your skill set, all of that? Yeah. Well, I, I think, I mean, one thing I realized when I was junior, um, is that I, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So if I'm going to do something, it has to be to the best of my ability. And whether it's, it's photocopying a book and making sure the staples in the right place, whether it's washing dishes, doing a deal, I, I'm not sure I'm that great at having a filter mm. between where I should give an A and where a B is good enough. Um, from an effort perspective. So I, I always do everything with an A and an A effort, which means I work really long hours mm. um, in the chase of perfection. And so as a junior bear, um, it was that same concept. Everything I did, it had to be exceptional. I, that was, I only had one level. If whatever I had my hands on, it had to be exceptional and B wasn't good enough. And, and then I realized that as I continued the desire to learn and to grow, that I had been a utility banker and I decided I wanted to branch out and do healthcare. Mm. And so I moved to Wachovia uh, with my, actually my current business partner, Lisa Beeson. And so I moved with her over to do healthcare and ended up doing 100% real estate. Like I said, I, you got to roll with the punches. So yeah. I, I did 100% real estate and, and then we moved over to Lehman and continued doing real estate. And through each one of those moves, you know, I, I had been really concerned about being pigeonholed as a utility banker when I was junior. Um, and yet here I am now, I think I'm 17 years into doing real estate. So again, I clearly got over uh, the desire to not be pigeonholed, but it was one of those things where you need to figure those things out yourself. And I moved around to a couple of firms doing that. But my movements across those firms were relationship driven, mm. right? As I, I'm a big believer that relationships are super important. And along with the mentors, it's, you know, I do everything. A lot of the stuff I do is based on relationships and trust. And yes, trust still exists. In, in banking, it does exist. It's, and so I, I moved through those firms and, and I got a really broad understanding a lot of different industries. And when you have to keep starting afresh, you get to learn to think through growing things and building things and growing businesses. So mm -hmm. by the time I'd moved to CB, it's, um, again, it was just an opportunity that presented itself. And I'm not sure I thought too much about um, whether, you know, sell, being on the sell side as a banker, being on the buy side too much because our job was so much focused on being a, an investment banker within a principal investing business. And, and so it sounded like a really exciting opportunity to challenge myself. And so in taking that, it was an absolutely amazing opportunity. It, it was, we got to oversee all of the investment programs globally and advise on corporate level transactions and portfolio transactions. And, and it, but what I got out of it is to look at every transaction differently. Hmm. It's coming from the sell side, you, you don't get as attached to what you're underwriting. So if you're selling a real estate company, we didn't get their numbers, but it's in the abstract almost. It's like, well, here's a property, here's a cap rate. What does the database say? And it's it's so much more um, high level and generalized. And I found over at the buy side, you you can't get away with that because you're investing capital that you're attached to and you own that deal. And, and I remember one of our first deals that came in was actually an office transaction. And uh, we underwrote it. We just come from the sell side. So we underwrote it. We did our numbers. And then, you know, we were very well supported by senior management. But when I put, come to actually pulling the trigger on the deal, you know, my partner and I both turned around and said, you know what, we're not going to do this. And I just can't get comfortable. So let's go look at our assumptions. And then we, we owned it. We took an ownership role to it. And, and we called up, you know, the CEO and we said, you know what? We've decided we don't want to do this deal. And he turned around and he said, welcome to the buy side. Hmm. <laughs> so learning to say no. 
And, and that yeah. I think has become a distinguishing characteristic of our firm is an ability to say no. So we say uh, clients on transactions, I just did this yesterday. Um, this is not the right deal. Yeah. You don't need to do this deal. You could do it and, and there could be amazing rewards. You could, but it may come at the price of you being able to sleep at night. So, you know, you need to balance those two things. And so now every deal we take on, we own it and, and we act as if it's own deals and whether it's something we like to do ourselves. And if we can't get comfortable with that, well, then we feel uncomfortable giving clients um, anything that's inconsistent with our thoughts on it. So you were, you were there, you were at CBRE, you got out of Lehman in time, mm -hmm. um, you jumped over I to did. CBRE. I did. Once again, right place, right time. You'll start to get a theme out of this, JR. Yeah. It's a little, I haven't been the right place at the right time. <laughs> a lot of times, actually. It seems to happen that way. What, what was it like being in a real estate focused firm at the beginning of the financial crisis in 2008, you know, given that real estate investing was really at the heart of the collapse? Yeah, so um, we it was a really interesting time because we had also raised a very large value-add opportunistic fund in our way. So, but at the same time, we had all these investment vehicles where there were bubblings of problems everywhere. Hmm. And what was unique about our group is we were independent from the investment teams because we sat above them. And so we didn't own any, we weren't attached um, from a responsibility standpoint within any of the investment funds. And so what would happen is, is that, you know, we'd often look at it as in the mornings, we were looking to deploy capital from our new vehicles. And in the afternoons, we were brought in to help address problems in the existing ones. And, and so it was a very, it was a very interesting role of uh, looking and being optimistic, but at the same time, um, the, the world was on fire and a lot of things had gone really sideways, really fast. And, and that caused problems for everybody. CB wasn't alone, caused mm -hmm. problems for everyone. And we were brought in because we weren't attached to a fund so we could provide an independent perspective uh, on whatever the investments were in each of those vehicles. And we had to do that on a global basis. Yeah, it must have been just, uh, you know, a crazy time to, to be in the real estate space. It was a crazy time. Uh, no crazier, again, than when we decided to start up a boutique, women-owned boutique real estate investment bank in the middle of the GFC. Right. Well, that was um, I don't know if that speaks question. to our intelligence or our <laughs> stupidity. Or, but... your, or, your, or your braveness. <laughs> I, again, at the time, I don't think we thought a whole lot about whether beyond the saying, you know what, this is something we want to do, so we're just going to do it. And, and I think, you know, we, we don't, I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about what I can't do. I only think about what I want to do and how I'm going to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's, if I got up, for example, every day and thought about the amount of stuff I need to do that day, I would just stay in bed. <laughs> it would just be easier. But we just decided we wanted to do it. And so that's what we were doing. End of story. And, yeah. and we've grown the business the same way that we see an opportunity and if we want to do it, we're going to do it. And then the only question we really ask ourselves is what is required to get it done? It's not whether it's a, whether we should. If we like the idea, we make the decision, we move on, and then it's what do we need to make it happen? Yeah. Well, it's good to have that action bias. Um, and it's especially important when you're in a small firm. You know, what, what were your early days as an entrepreneur like more generally? How did, how did you bootstrap the business and get yourself to, you know, having a, a going concern. Yeah. So the early days, um, long hours is mm. the way I would put it. Uh, again, we didn't really think about it. Just we had to do what needed to be done. But we had originally started, we had gotten a phone call, which is what inspired us to start the business to help an investment manager to acquire another investment manager. And so we were asked if we would help, we would help on it. And so we did. But then once you start doing that, it's then you need to be paid and you need an engagement letter and then you need a company name right. and then you need to incorporate. And the next thing you know, we have an office. It's got a name over the door. It's shared space. We're taking baby steps here. But it was the one thing led to another, led to another. Mm -hmm. and, and the next thing you know, we have we have a firm and we have people and we have clients and, and the rest is off to the races. But those early days where you're still trying to balance 
you know, figuring it out. We figured it all out on our own. We didn't take any outside money um, at all. We didn't take, we didn't have a board. We didn't have advisors. We didn't have any of that stuff. We just decided this was a great idea and we were going to do it. Um, And then we, we moved forward. But, but what would happen is, is that, you know, during the night we would be our analysts, associates, vice presidents, principals, and MDs, and we ran the company, uh, we were all, wore all of those hats. So as quick as we were giving advice, we were going back and processing it and, and working it all out from the outset. So we wore so many hats. It was crazy, but we didn't think about it. We, we yeah. just did what needed to be done. Um, and then we continued to move forward. But as we got more comfortable with what we were doing, you know, we obviously hired and we got a bigger office and we yep. started to, but it was a consequence of we need to figure it out. And, yeah. and that's what we just got to do. And pretty much everybody, when they're a new entrepreneur, makes mistakes. Um, yeah, I can tell by your face, you, you, you have, you know, you have probably a long list. I, I could certainly relate to that. How, you know, what were some of your early mistakes and how did you adjust course? Yeah, look, I, um, I think as a firm, we probably should have invested in um, building culture a lot quicker mm. in the early days, bringing on people earlier. Um, in our original, when we were building out the firm, but I've always had the view and it's good and it's bad. It's, I've always had the view that we lead with top line. We don't lead with cost. Mm. And so you need to have the revenue to support the cost. And we're not going to hire a hundred people in search of revenue. And, and, and that's just a philosophy on being raised poor (laughs) and we didn't have any money. And so we counted every penny. And, and, and sometimes that may be to our detriment where I am very focused on cost and exercising discipline and making sure we justify cost and we're going to incur cost to have to be able to justify it. And in some ways we could argue that inhibits growth uh, by not being willing to take on more risk um, than what we, what we were willing to take and could have we gotten to where we are today faster, maybe um, as, as a result of that. But now that I, I'm, I've been at it for quite a while and we've done really well and we've built the firm, you know, I'm loosening up a, a little bit on this stuff. Not too much, but I yeah. am loosening up a, a, a little bit. But you kind of, it's it's the balance between you have to spend money to make money yeah. to, you know, lead with the top line and then have the, the cost follow. And there is a balance there because it, it means that, you know, do I always perfectly allocate my time? Probably not as a result. Yeah. I mean, one of my friends who, who teaches entrepreneurship at Brown, you know, talks about the fact that one of the advantages of being a startup is that you don't have a lot of resources and, you know, <laughs> it, it, it forces you to think about how to get things done without having a lot. Um, and you watch what happens to these startups that get some, you know, big funding round. It's like they go out and they blow a lot of money on things that probably aren't really important to the, you know, future of the business. So in some ways being resource constrained can be an advantage. Yeah, it's it's leading with uh, the belief that um, how do I make money out of this? And it's yeah. interesting because that's what my clients ask me is how do I make money out of this? But I'm so entrenched in the mindset of myself, how do I make money out of this? That, you know, when I'm talking to clients that I'm not giving my thoughts and sharing my thoughts on any other basis. That's the basis on which it's being shared is because yeah. I don't know how to think about it any other way. Because I haven't never had that environment since we've started where, you know, you could, you could be thoughtless and careless with dollars. And yeah. so I'm as thoughtful and careful with the people, their capital, as I am with my own. And, yeah. and again, that all comes back to the buy side of needing to live your advice. See, when you're in a, a bulge background with the banking background I had, there's only so much attachment you really need to have to your own advice, right? Because you're not there post-close. Right. right. But for us in our firm, we have built it. We've built the business on the back of pretty much two things. One is that we really understand the industry. And, and so our advice is informed advice. It's not candid. That, that's the practical reality. Hmm. And, and then I also think that along that is that we have to live and we live and breathe the advice that we give because we've come from that background and it fundamentally changed us. And, and so we focus on what's this deal going to look like post-close? And does it make sense um, in that framework? And because of those two things, a lot of our clients, or most of our clients, if not all, are repeat clients. 
they come to us to do multiple things over time. And once we start working with a client, they become entrenched. And we look at them as we treat ourselves as life cycle bankers, where yeah. our job is to be an extension of our clients in how to think about things and, and giving them the resources and help that they need. But if we can't help, um, I'm the very first person to say, we're not your people for this. When yeah. We're not. This is not our expertise. I don't need to take on something that is not going to work and I can't deliver on. I, my life is too short and I can't make any money, any money out of that. You, you were, you know, two women, women-owned business, operating in a very male-dominated industry. What was that like? Did you face any particular challenges being a woman-owned business in this space? Look, I um, investment banking in general has... Is, has, does not have a lot of women in it. And certainly when I grow up, there wasn't. And the amount of women who make it all the way to the top is, is even fewer. And in real estate, it's exactly the same. Now, there are women in real estate, but, and increasingly so, but there's, it's a very small group once you get to the C-suite, mm -hmm. very small. So the combination of those two things, yes, it's, um, there are definitely... Um, there has been, I notice now how few women there are in senior positions within the industry. And, and I hope to be an advocate to change that. Um, but I, I'm not sure it's a consequence of, of, of anything environmentally that's held me back. I, I went into banking. Banking took a chance on me. I've survived through banking. CB took a chance on me. I've started up my firm and clients every day take a chance at me. And all, most, if not all of our clients are males, they're, they're men. And, and I would like to think that we get hired because we're smart and we're really, really good at our jobs. Um, and quite frankly, I'm perfectly comfortable uh, thinking that is the case. Which is fair enough, right? I mean, as we talked about a little bit before the, the recorded session, you know, best case is everybody's treated equally, right? It implies we've gotten to a point of everybody really being viewed equally. Yeah. And look, for me, I don't know how I could sit here and, and, and have this conversation with you today and, and be anything other than grateful for the industry that's helped me get there. Yeah. Right. As I've had a huge amount of mentors at every step of the way throughout my career and they've all been men. Um, and, and I'm very fortunate that I have business partners who are women who are fabulous and they're my closest friends. Um, and there's a complete level of trust there that, mm. you know, I look at, you know, I look at again, what needs to be done and how do I go about doing it? And, and I don't let a whole lot of anything else factor into what needs to get there. I think you could drive yourself crazy if you want to overly focus on the external factors that yeah. of what if, or what could, or what should, or could be, I just focus on where I need to go and what do I need to do to get there. Which is a good, good philosophy to have. So let's fast forward to today. What's What's the business look like today? How many people? How many locations? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so we are, we've continued to grow over time and we've actually had a bit of a hiring spurt this year. Um, we're based in Stanford, Connecticut. We were in the city for uh, many years and moved out right before COVID. And, and it's not because I was smart about that. It just happened to be a case where we were had moved out of the city and the partners, we were saying, well, why should we travel an hour and a half each way each day? Right, That's right. like, do you add up all those hours, how much time we're wasting traveling? We should just move the office. Right. And so we moved it out to Stanford, and, uh, which has been great. It has been, it has been great. And we have uh, a satellite down in Florida, in, in Tampa, Florida. And uh, I have a business partner out on the West Coast. And so, you know, we try and do a broad coverage. We, as we've built the business a little bit through COVID. We, we balance in-place work with out-of-place uh, remote mm -hmm. and we, make, we, just, we just make it work. Um, as for a business where we are, you know, we had built the business around our first investment management deal and we had originally started on doing capital raising too within real estate. And fast forward through to today, you know, our business has got a lot broader. We still do uh, M&A for whether it's uh, REITs, owner operators, service companies, um, investment managers is a big piece of our business. We work on corporate level transactions there. We still do capital raising. So we'll do joint ventures, separate accounts, private placements. We have that business has continued to, to grow. And then we, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, 
we began investing investing in a consulting, uh, building out a consulting practice. Okay. And so we do a lot more on the consulting side and whether it's for pension plans or it's for insurance companies on allocations or how to think about deploying capital in the real estate space, it can work on strategic planning for investment managers and owner operators, et cetera, on how to grow their business. We do ESG consulting. So okay. it's a little bit of the gamut, but what ties all of it together is that we're an industry specialist. We are a real estate industry specialist. And so we can touch and provide services across the spectrum, but it comes down to understanding asset levels up and corporate level down. Mm -hmm. And because we own alpha, you know, own the the desire to want to understand our space, that we focus on making sure we're fluent and we understand the real estate. And, and that's what really drives it. I don't understand how we could give strategic advice to someone, but not understand the industry that they, un they operate in at a right. fundamental basic level. And so, you know, on our website, as well as on our LinkedIn, we publish a lot of papers, uh, we call them CCG perspectives mm -hmm. on things and uh, trends in the industry that we see coming. And that's because if you think about it, we straddle all buckets of capital. So we straddle from the, the LPs, limited partners who have the capital, mm. all the way down to the owner operators and service companies who are deploying the capital. So we get to see what people want and what people need and where people want to put their capital. And that's what makes us, we call it the spectrum. And, and that gives us access and a level of, um, of knowledge and an understanding that touches all facets of all areas of the real estate industry. And we, we can process that and use that to be very intelligent and form our own views around where we think the trends are. And I call them, what's the next new, new thing? Or yeah. is it just a, a new way of doing something old? And, and looking at those things, and, and we have a lot of fun doing it. So we'll see is something and we'll write about it. Um, and as a result, we people read this stuff and they call me and want to debate it. And that's great. Yeah, it's good to have that thought leadership. You know, just it brings some focus to a different way of looking at you relative to your peers, right? Yes, yes, it definitely does. So, you know, we, we've we done quite a bit of work in the insurance industry where, you know, folks are looking to build a presence in the United States or in real estate. And they, they're like, well, how do I do that? I want to be in real estate. It's an asset class. We're not in it. How do I go about doing it? I said, oh, well, okay. And we can help them develop a strategy um, and then help them find the target. Then we can help them deploy capital into it. So it covers the full spectrum of meeting and being a full service uh, advisor to servicing whatever needs they need in order to do that. But the reason we can do that is, A, we know the industry players, we know the managers, we know the people who own the real estate, the companies that own the real estate, but we also can say, well, if this is your criteria of what you want, then we can help you match where that would most suit and how to best fit it so that what we're advising on isn't just, you know, a list of targets. It's we've thought about it and we put the time and energy into saying, well, you know what, this is a good cultural fit. And not only that, these guys are good at this and these guys are good at that. And that level of capability means that, you know, we're, that when we call folks with opportunities, people take our call because yeah. we think it's a good fit and, and we've built trust and a reputation around it that if we're going to call you, it's because we think it's a good fit for you. Um, yeah. And so we got to, we protect that reputation because uh, it's, it, I think at this point, it helps define who we are as a company. What about your role specifically? You're in a business, you've got partners, you know, how do you kind of divide things up and where do you focus your time? What's, what's a day like for you or a typical day like for you? Well, we're in the business building mode. I'm always in the business building mode. I spend a lot of time thinking about what's the next thing? What's the next opportunity? What do I see? And, you know, we've started to also moving into looking at investing and acting as an independent sponsor and starting to use our capabilities as understanding corporates and real estate and saying, you know what, well, why don't we take some bets on these things? And so companies where we ordinarily couldn't have worked with because they can't afford us, right. we're now saying, well, look, why don't we work with you and we'll help raise capital for you and then we can help you build your company. So all these services that I charge somebody else for, you know, right. I can take and invest with you and help you build that business. And that requires, uh, 
you know, a level of understanding, ability to underwrite the company and understand the product and understand where it's got a hope of actually making it. Uh, but th that's also an underwriting of the team and being able to, to assess whether we're willing to take a bet on the management team. Because a lot of companies, and we, we've certainly seen a lot of technology companies come into this space, part of the reason they don't work is it's um, to, they don't understand that there's a challenge in making sure you understand the real estate and making sure that if you have a good idea, that you have the goods to execute on it. Mm -hmm. And to be able to come up with that view, it's, it's a little bit of, you know, I've done this a long time, but making judgment calls on whether I think the management team can execute. So I'm spending a little more time on that. Our company continues to grow. So I'm trying to, I got management of resources, management of business lines, management yep. of deals, pipeline, what we're covering, who we're covering, how we're going about it, making sure we're putting resources in the right places as the business continues to grow. And as we've done that, you know, filling in the ranks, and making sure I can move out of that execution place um, in order to, and to be able to make sure the company still functions and I'm still involved in things so that our clients still get the best advice, they get the right advice. Uh, so staying on top of all of those things is definitely, definitely, JR, a balancing act. Yeah, I, I can imagine. What do you make of the real estate market right now? I mean, you've got this, you know, in the commercial space, you've got him back to hybrid work, companies maybe needing less office space because they don't have as many people in the office on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, up until I'll say recently, the, you know, the real, the residential real estate market's just been scorching, obviously probably cooling off a bit with interest rates going up, but what's, what's your take on the state of play in the market itself? So COVID um, created some uh, really interesting opportunities. So, you know, a lot of the press was focused on what was going on in the hotel space and why this is tough for retail and why it's tough for office. But, you know, for folks in the industry, it's actually a really exciting time because the market had gotten super efficient. And so arbitrage opportunities uh, were increasingly difficult to find and, and real estate got really pricey. Mm -hmm. And through COVID, if you think about it, so whenever you have people migrating, from one place to another, the ramifications for the real estate industry are significant, right? Let's just think about it. You take a family, they move from New York to Texas. Okay, so they need you somewhere to live. Do they rent? Do they buy? Okay. Okay, once they're there, the kids need to go to school. They have to find a new store to go to the grocery store. Are they moving into an office or are they not? Now, they're still down there. So whether there's e-commerce or not, how are you going to get them their products? Okay, so now I got to deal with logistics. How does mm -hmm. the end of logistics? What about cold storage? If I'm shipping stuff there, I need cold storage. So, and then I need labs, then I need medical office. So you can think through if you take that one family and times it out, right. that you can start to see shifts in migration and how it rattles through the real estate. So the trick was, and for the winners and this losers, is where did they go? And I'm not talking macro. It's good enough to say Texas, great. But where in Texas? Real estate's a local market business, yeah. right? So where did they go in Texas? Where do I put that supermarket? If we're going to judge it at a one, three mile radius, five mile radius, where are they going? Right? And you got to stay on top of this. You got to manage the supply. You have to manage the demand. So there's a lot goes into something like that has rolled out through the past two years. And those are trends. And then you also got to balance in there the, the extra, uh, the extra change in demographics from generational shifts mm -hmm. where we've already seen over the past 10 years that the generational shift as, as the millennials have come up and have become renters and now working and they're now shopping, the, their patterns as, as individuals have evolved. Yep. And so if you think about the next technology age, the next generation is very communal. They're focused on social, work-life balance. I'd love a dime for every time someone had said to me, well, that's not the way it was when I was younger. I mean, that concept, you know, is led to changes in human behavior and so real estate has to respond to that as well, right? So as much as real estate gets identified as a B2B, it really is a B2C because it's the consumer that drives all of these patterns and all of these changes. So yep. balancing that over the past two years has been really awesome to see the evolution. But, you know, we've looked at, you know, if you're balancing like senior housing, there's now split outs of active adult living, which is a new niche product, I think is super cool. Manufactured housing, I just wrote about in the role of technology coming in and disrupting that industry. We had co-living merge as a new 
uh, as a new form of multifamily, although I'm not sure it was quite new, new, but then there was co-working. So there's all these new things, even within your big buckets, that new pe people have come in and looked at things in a new light and it brought a fresh perspective. And that's really awesome. And for, for an industry that has been kind of resistant to a whole lot of change, it's I think change is, is on us, it's forced on us. And, and those who adjust and move with that and, and become adaptable, a succeeding trade of any entrepreneur, then there will be winners and losers. And, and that's why, you know, for us, uh, it's been really exciting time to be part of the industry and be part of, you know, the team of trying to see what's coming around the next corner as opposed to saying i'm worrying about what happened yesterday yesterday is gone it ain't coming back right you got to be forward thinking and where you're going because to get anything out of the ground or to close on a deal doesn't take days it takes a really long time so you need to be forward thinking and where is the risk that you're willing to take yeah which is i think inherent in you know investing in illiquid assets with very long payback times you're also on the board of a public real estate investment trust how, do, how does being on a board differ from being a business owner? How has being on that board made you a better business owner? Well, I mean, the greatest benefit is that I'm not the CEO. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, I get to, you know, we advise uh, boards and CEOs of REITs, public companies uh, and private companies too. That's that's our business. And, you know, I balance running my own business as a CEO. And so in some ways, you know, being on a board is like what I, when I'm advising a board, it's I take the same level of integrity toward performing my role there as I do. But at the end of the day is uh, I'm still not the CEO. So you've got that backstop and the, the ball ultimately goes to them, right? Yeah, but the CEO is the person, is the end of the day, that's why he's called the chief executive officer. Exactly. You, you're also involved in some pretty high profile trade associations in the industry. So how, how do you think about, you know, the, the time you commit to them, your involvement in them relative to the other things that obviously are keeping you very busy? You're, you're saying to me, sound, make me sound very busy. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have gotten out of bed this morning. So, you know, I'm, um, I'm uh, one industry organization we're involved in is NARIM and I love it. It's yeah. I'm on the chief executive committee for that, uh, chief executive officer committee. And we just had our uh, NARIM uh, offsite uh, a couple of weeks ago out in Utah. And it's phenomenal. It's, it doesn't have the same format as a lot of the other industry conferences uh, that are sponsored. It's small team, it's small group, uh, smaller numbers. And we get to sit there, you know, with other C-suite and, you know, uh, CEOs and talk about real issues of the day. Mm -hmm. Like really talk and around tables where we get to interact with peers around those issues. And, you know, I get to be part of the planning committee and, and to help decide with, with the rest of the committee around what those issues should be and, and then to have the discussion with it. And I always find it is so, it's collaborative, it's inspiring and it is just, and, and people are so, um, are, are so willing to share uh, information around the challenges. And so it's an open dialogue. And for me, it's, it's both, um, I learn a lot and give a lot. And, and I, I can't imagine, it's just, it's really a phenomenal, it's really a phenomenal organization. Yeah, it's great when you've got those trade associations that really do their part. I mean, some are obviously better than others and to a large degree, I mean, they're partly made by the staff, the full-time staff, but what I've experienced is they're often more times really driven by the sort of the level of engagement that they're able to get in people who are in the industry itself, because that's, to your point, that's where the, you know, the most interesting conversations happen because you're all out doing it day to day, right? You are practitioners in this space and have a level of understanding and probably a language that you can speak to each other, you know, yep. that, you know, is at a different level than what, you know, would otherwise, would otherwise be available. Yeah. And, you know, you get to talk about things like how do you retain talent? What yeah. are you doing? What are you doing? It's like we get to talk about the challenges that we see, uh, you know, because right now talent retention is 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 tougher than it's ever been, is keeping your people and in making the right level of commitment for the right level of return. 
in a world where the next generation is, you know, you pick up a resume and they've got a lot more jobs on it when I had it their age. You know, yeah. when I was at Morgan Stanley, I thought I was going to stay there forever. Yeah. And so I was there for a long time. And a lot of the resumes you see now have a lot of different positions on there and they've moved around a fair bit already. But it's a cultural shift. It plays into how they live and how they work and how they interact. It, it is different. So when, when I tell people, you know, since we've been in business, you, my business partner and I, we've known each other for 20 years, right? So, and, and our, a lot of the people we work with at our firm have been with us since we started the firm. And so we're a well-oiled machine, whether it's internal or external, we use the same people. We're very loyal in our relationships. And so, and I think that carries through even with our clients, where some of our clients we've had for over a decade. And, and, and we just work with them on multitudes of different things. And so to me, loyalty and trust and, and working as a team and respecting the team and contributing to the team is incredibly meaningful to me. Yeah. And yeah. so I've tried to instill that same mentality through throughout our firm. But it is hard, right? Because, you know, you're everyone is only part one thing. And you, there are external forces and there are external things that influence every day and in a, in a world driven by technology, right? Which makes such a difference because when I was a young banker, we didn't barely have cell phones. I remember when they got a Palm Pilot and we thought it was extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, so the world is very fluid and it's very transparent. And, and how you continue to operate that, operate within that and install loyalty and trust is increasingly difficult relative to, to when I was a younger banker. Yeah, I mean, things definitely have changed. Values have changed. The way people look at work has changed. The way that they move around, um, in some cases, move in and out of the workforce, you know, all of that continues to evolve. And for me, you know, that's part of what makes it interesting, right? That it's not the same world that it was last year or the year before or the year before that. Yeah. Well, look, I'm still doing this 25 years later. Uh, and as much to my chagrin, it, and I'll tell you what, that's even influenced how I look at hiring. It's, yeah. you know what, it's, I am a non-traditional hire that way because I did not have the background and someone took a chance on me right. to get to me to where I am. And they clearly saw something, you know, I, in order to make it this far, but I've been doing this for 25 years and I still love it. I get up every day and I can't wait to start my work. I know it needs to get done and I could work all the time if mm. I didn't have other responsibilities and be perfectly happy doing it. I, I can't believe I get to call this a job, uh, but I come in, I get, I, I'm lucky enough to do every day. I just, I feel very, very blessed um, that, you know, I think a lot of people spend a lifetime looking for that thing that makes them happy. Yeah. And I've had the benefit of having it since the day I left college. I can't believe which, it. Which is an, an incredible blessing. Yeah. So work, work, as you say, it's an important part of your life. What do you, what do you do to recharge your batteries? What are the things that that give you sort of joy and passion outside of the workplace? Well, I'm a big runner. Uh, I love to run. I think in part for my sanity. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not going to run any marathons, but I I do love to run. And uh, you know, I I like to hang out with my family. So I'm I'm lucky for that. Um, I love to sit and just read exceptionally sometimes trashy books. Yeah. Uh, I love to listen. Um, to, I, I love information. So I do a lot of audio or audible books too, but I love that balance. My favorite pastime is probably I read the, the weekend journal every weekend in my kitchen yeah. when it's peace and quiet. Nobody's up, not even the dog. And I get to see there and I read that paper from cover to cover. And I, however many cups of tea it takes me to get through it, and I look forward to it every weekend, just the peace and quiet, just for a minute. Yeah. And I always learn something new. I re I literally read a cover to cover. It's it's part of my weekend routine. It's the one stable that yeah. I have is to enjoy my newspaper every weekend. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> I'll make a note of not interrupting you at whatever <laughs> early hour you're up reading. The, reading yes, the it's book. very early. It's still dark because I, it, you know, it's to get up before everybody else gets up is always the challenge because if it gets interrupted, it's game over. I won't yeah. get back to the paper. Once that moment is lost, it's gone forever and I can't get it back. Yeah, I hear you. It's good to have those moments of peace and also to have those, those daily or weekly rituals. Exactly, uh, exactly. How, how are you thinking about the next, you know, few years of your career and your business? What, what, what's ahead for you? Well, I want to continue growing our business lines. Um, I, we, earlier on, we had actually thought about making and doing investments ourselves and investing alongside 
uh, limited partners and mm-hmm. I'm going to get that off the ground. I, I've been, a, I'm a gunner, um, but I, this year we've started to do it. And so I want to spend more time on building that piece of our business and, and putting uh, ourselves behind the deals instead of just telling others they should do them is yeah. to invest in them ourselves. And so I'm really excited to build that out and look for the opportunities. We've got a few things going on to build out our existing business. Um, I tend to look at you you grow through product distribution and geography. Um, try not to do it all at once because that's an integration nightmare, but to be a little methodical about it. And so I continually look at each one of those buckets and say, how can we grow our business and, and focus on best use of resources, but also at the same time, what do we need to do to get best use of resources, but how can we go beyond that without mm. getting too ahead of ourselves and yeah. be disciplined about it? Because if the bottom drops out of the world, you know what? That's I don't want to lose sleep about that. And so I, I'm cognizant of, of balancing those things, but a desire at the same time to build everything. And, and every year has been more exciting than the last. Um, I'm super excited a, about the things we have going on, super excited about what our clients are doing and what we are is doing as a team. So it's really cool. Yeah, which is a great place to be. Uh, last question. Um, yeah. Advice you would give your younger self or for that matter, anybody else who's contemplating, you know, how to manage their career. Yeah, I shouldn't have sweat the small stuff. I mean, things I thought was so important when I was younger and I was starting out just weren't. They just yeah. weren't. I, I should have enjoyed things more. Um, for what I, I had, and I worked an enormous amount of hours, but things that I thought were important on that A perfection probably weren't as much as I, as I thought they were. So now that I'm older, you know, I get to give advice and I get to work on the things I want to give the advice that I feel confident on. And, and I think, you know, if for anyone who's listening, it's trust your instincts, trust your gut, yeah. um, and, and go with it and just go with it. Don't second guess. Don't second guess. It's an entrepreneur's nightmare. Don't second guess. Make your decisions. Move on. Live with them because there's nothing that bad that can, you can ever do that cannot be unwound. <laughs> there's nothing. There is nothing that bad that you cannot fix. So yeah. go with your instinct. Go with the flow and don't sweat the small stuff. Not worth it. Great advice. So we'll, we'll wrap it up there. This has been a really great conversation. Good to get to know you and hear a little bit more about the real estate investing space. So I appreciate you reaching out and thanks for making time today. Jaya, this has been fun. I, I hope your listeners um, that we've it, that was worth, you know, they got something out of it. So if we've done that, then I think we've served our purpose. I'd like to thank Deborah for joining me today and sharing her journey through investment banking and real estate investing. If you're ready to take control of your career, visit pathwise.io. If you'd like more regular career insights, you can become a Pathwise member. Basic membership is free. You can also sign up on the website for the Pathwise newsletter and follow Pathwise on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.